What does that even mean, Bowers Game Cornar? Hi there, YouTube! I'm back again today for another game review, but a special Kickstarter review. Today, I'm very excited to check out Council of Blackthorn from Great Northern Games. It's for two to six players, ages 13 plus. It'll take about 45 to 90 minutes to play. And in Council of Blackthorn, you are playing as someone who is underneath the king, and the king is slowly but surely dying. So you're trying to position yourself well with the nobles and the legions and the peasants, trying to position yourself to be the next king. But you have to be careful because you don't want to be too treacherous or you will be beheaded at the end of the game game and instantly lose the game. This is a game with asymmetrical powers where you're going to be positioning for victory points. Let's check it out. Alrighty then, we're going to take a look at what you're going to get inside of Council of Blackthorn. Before I get started, I do want to mention this is the promotional copy I have in front of you. So take everything you see here with a grain of salt. First and foremost, we've got our handy dandy rule booklet. This is an outstanding rule booklet. It's about seven pages, double sided, full color, full of pictures, illustrations, and examples. And quite honestly, this is one of the best rule booklets I've gotten in the Kickstarter prototype ever. This is very professionally done. Huge thumbs up. So in Council of Blackthorn, you are going to be playing as someone underneath the king, trying to gain the most victory points in a variety of different ways. These are going to be the victory points down here that will come in increments of 1, 2, 3, and 5, and they are going to be secret, so you're never actually going to know exactly how everyone is doing on victory points. Along the way, though, you're going to gain these green cards right here, which are going to be treason cards. They'll come in increments of 0, 1, 2, and 3. Three. At the end of the game, whoever has the most victory or the most treason cards, I should say, is going to have their head chopped off. They automatically lose the game. So it doesn't matter if they have more victory points, they automatically lose because they have the most treason cards. So that's about the generalities of the game. Let's go over the components, then we'll get in the gameplay. Hopefully all of this will make sense because it actually is quite a simple game. So first on the component side, uh, when you first start the game, each player is going to get one of these little guys right here, which is going to be the six different players that you'll be able to play with in the game. Each one is its own asymmetrical power. So each person is going to have unique actions that they will be able to do that no one else will be able to do. And they also have persistent effects that they will have that no one else will have. So for instance, the Minister of Coin, you do not score treason points from three bribe cards, and your first played building auto triggers. So essentially you're going to be able to build a building right from the jump, and also if you play on three die, which we'll talk about later, uh, you're not going to have to take treason cards. So that's really good. Next we have the Lord of War. Your base hand size is six cards, so you're going to have more cards in your hands to look at. You're also going to start with an extra card, and you start the game at level one with the legions, uh, which is the axe over here, because you're going to try and make yourself popular with these different factions. So each person is going to get their own asymmetrical ability, and then they're going to take their four little cubes or tokens that they have right here. They're going to place it on the starting spot for the peasants, the guild, the noble, and the legion, because I'm going to go over the different ways you can score points. Now you'll be able to earn these victory points right here through playing cards and very, doing various different things, but one of the primary ways you're going to score points are by making yourself popular with the peasants, the guilds, the noble, and the legion. When you do that, you're going to be able to move yourself up on this track right here, going up all the way to 13 points. Also, if you're at 13 points, you are the only person who's allowed to be there. Two people may not share the 13 which means it's kind of a race to get there, but along the way, people can bump you down. In fact, that's one of the asymmetrical powers. Uh, the guy lets you, he specifically can bump you down without even really trying, which is un uh, unfortunate for you and great for him. So, you're going to score points by moving yourself up the track and also by building buildings. So, I talked a little bit earlier about how you'll be able to do actions on your turn. And because of your asymmetrical power, but there are also buildings that you can build right here. And if you build a building, you will gain additional actions that you and only you or other people who build the same building will be able to do, but it also will gain you victory points at the end of the game. So those are going to be the different ways that you will score victory points. Next, you might notice that there are four die that are going to be on the board. At the beginning of each round, you're going to roll these dice. These dice are very important. We'll talk a little bit about more about them later. Uh, last but not least, component-wise, we're going to have this big handy-dandy turn sequence chart, which I really hope they turn into the uh, the player cheat sheet card, because this is extremely useful, and we're going through this as I show you how the game is played. 
Before we do that, let's take a look at some of the action cards. These are going to be black cards, at least the, the, the prototype. And these are very important because these are what you're going to be doing on your turn. So let's just go through a mock turn sequence and you can see exactly how this works. So the first thing you're going to do is you're going to complete a building. Because as I mentioned, you can build buildings. When you first lay down a building, it's going to be tilted 90 degrees. It's going to be tapped, but I can't say that. And then once you start your turn, it will go upright and you'll be able to use its action. So next you'll be able to play one of your actions, either from your character sheet, aka doing this action down here, or on your building. Uh, you can choose not to do that and move on to the play a card function. And the play a card feature is really where the game gets its bite, because you're going to do two things when you play a card. You're going to get the dice result, which we'll talk about a little bit, and then you'll get the trigger, the text effect, and I'll talk more about that. So when you first start the game, you're going to start with uh, X amount of cards, depending. Generally, it's going to be five. And you're going to take a look at your cards, and so there's going to be five different cards you're going to get. Five, five different kinds of cards you're going to get. You're going to get yellow cards, which will correspond to the guild. White cards correspond to the peasants. Blacks for the legions, and reds for the noble. And when you play one of these cards, the first thing you're going to do is you are going to take that color's dice effect. So if I played a yellow card, I would move up two right now on the guild immediately. I go one, two, and I am now more popular with the guilds. So that's great. So next, I would look to see if I have triggered the text effect on the card. So how does that work? I would look here at this number of the symbol. So if I am at least a level three on the legion, aka the axe, over here, then I would trigger this effect. If not, I just immediately discard this card and move along with my turn. So in this scenario, if I were at least a level three with the legion, I would gain three victory points, which is great, and I would also get to reduce a target's legion by one level. So I would get to bump someone else down, which would be incredibly useful. So this is a great card to play when I can trigger that ability. So how do the dice work? If you go, if you play uh, a yellow right now, you would get to move two on the yellow track. If you played a red right now, you would get to move one on the red track. If you played a black right now, which has the elusive three, you get to move up three on the black track. But you're you're really making some waves when you do that, and as a result, you're also going to draw two treason cards. Which, as we mentioned, if you have too many of those at the end of the game, you might get your head chopped off. Uh, so the zero is the most interesting one, though, because it's really not that helpful specifically for its dice effect. You gain zero faction levels. So if you play a white card right now, you're not going to gain any popularity with the peasants. But you get to give one of your random treason cards to a target, which next takes me to the trigger effect. And I explain the trigger effect pretty much right there. Uh, so for instance, if I play this white priestess card, I'd look over there, and I would gain zero Unfortunately, I would gain zero with the peasants, but then I would look to see if I triggered my uh, my axe effect, my legion effect, which I would need a four on the legion. So let's just pretend that I wasn't a four on the legion. Let's just say I was on a two on the legion. Well, you're in luck because if you play on a zero die, you trigger automatically. So this is a good time to look at that and say, man, I really don't think I'm going to be able to trigger this ability anytime soon. But if there's a zero down there on that die, on that white die, then you would be able to trigger this ability, and that really could help you out long term in the game. Likewise, when you play on a three, you automatically fail your trigger ability because you're just choosing to schmooze a lot with the legion and move yourself up, so you would not be able to trigger the ability on the bottom of the card. It's a delicate balancing act. Now, how do buildings work? Well, here's a good example. We got one right here. Buildings are the exact same way. If you were able to, uh, if you, so for instance, this one, if you were at least a five with the nobles, uh, the red guys over there, then you're going to trigger this building. You put it down in play, tap when you first start the game, and then the next time, uh, or the, when you first start, uh, when you first start the round, you flip it back up, and bada boom, you have a new action you can take, or in this, in this case, a new persistent effect that you'll be able to take, along with victory points at the end of the game. So. Let's go over real quick. You're going to put your building upright. If you have a building, you're going to do one of your actions, either on your character or on your building, if you want to. You'll play a card, and you'll do the dice effect first, which will allow you to gain influence with the different factions. And then you will see if you trigger the text effect. Also, paying attention to the fact that if it's a zero, you automatically trigger it. Or a three, you automatically fail it. And then you get to do a draw and discard phase. It doesn't say discard on here, which hopefully they fix. But you have the option to discard one of your cards and then draw back up to your hand size. Uh, so you would do that, and then you score for control. And this is another way that you can gain victory points. So how this works is, 
If you're in first place with either the guild, the noble, the legion, or the peasant, you're going to gain two points for each one you're, you're in first place with. So for right now, we'd say, oh, I'm in first place in the guild, so I would gain two victory points. Also, the buildings work the same way. So if you had the most buildings, you would gain two points for that. So if you were first place in the guild, first place in buildings, you would gain four points. Then you look to see if you're tied anywhere for first. If you're tied anywhere for first, you're going to gain one point. So for instance, if I was tied uh, for on, on a one with the peasants, then I would gain one point for that. You also have to be at least on the board in order to gain the one point or the two point bonuses there. Um, last kind of card I do want to mention is the Whispers card. I'm not sure if I mentioned this or not. This is going to be a card that's going to allow you uh, to gain one level in any single faction when you play the card. And also it's going to penalize whoever's in first place by a lot making them draw treason cards, which obviously can get your head potentially cut off. You're going to rinse, wash, and repeat. So when does the game end? The game ends at the end of a round, or at least once during someone's turn, Three of the 13 spots have been filled up, at which point you're going to tally up your points, tally up the treason cards, uh, chop off someone's head, or potentially more than one person's head if there's a tie treason-wise, and then whoever has the most victory points will be the winner of the game, and that, in a nutshell, is how Council of Blackthorn is played. Alright then, Council of Blackthorn, what are my final thoughts? Let's go to the pros, let's go to the cons. First on the cons side, the game is not going to be for everybody for a variety of different reasons. Analysis paralysis can poke its ugly head in with this game. Now it's a very simple game, and for a lot of people, turns are going to be very quick. However, if you have analysis paralysis, your turns will stretch out, especially when you get to the discard phase, because there's a lot to look at on these cards. You know, do I want to discard this card? And which cards are going to stack well together? Which buildings do I want to keep? So on and so forth. And that will stretch out turns, especially in a five and six player game, which go on just a little bit longer than you're going to want them to, especially when there's not much player interaction in between turns. Also, two player wise, I worry about the asymmetrical powers. Now, the asymmetrical powers, I feel, are pretty well balanced, and they balance themselves out very well in a three, four, five, six player game. However, in a two player game, I worry about how well balanced they are because there's only one other person to attack you to sort of knock you down, especially with the Master of Shadows, the one that can just give away all their trees and cards. Now, they try and mitigate that by making it so that in a two player game, uh, you don't get your head chopped off unless you have double the amount of treason points. But the bottom line is the Master of Shadows can give away pretty much all their treason cards throughout the game, which means they most of the time, I would imagine, are going to win a two-player game. And when I played a two-player game with the Master of Shadows, I tried specifically to do that, and I just I crushed him. I lost by points by a good deal on victory points. But the bottom line is I had zero treason cards, and he had, like, I think, five points just because he was trying to get rid of them the whole time and was not able to. So it is something that I wanted to note. Also graphic design wise there's some very minor graphic design things that I think would give the game an extra layer of polish and usability that I mentioned in an email to the creator of the game. Any other cons I have with the game? Um, not really that I can think of because overall I really enjoyed Council of Blackburn. I enjoyed this game an awful lot. What did I like about the game? First and foremost, it's a very simple game at its core. You just, I mean, you complete your building if you have one, you do one of the actions either on a building or on a card, and then you play a card. You look at the dice effect, and then you look at the bottom trigger effect. You trigger it, you do it. If you don't, you just move onward. You discard a card, you draw your cards, or if you don't want to discard, you don't do that, and then you move along your wary way while you score points. And it's a very straightforward, streamlined game. But there's a good amount of bite with this game when I'm deciding how you want to approach it. Do you want to play the card now because it's going to move you up on that track or do you want to hold on to it in your hand? You know, wasting valuable hand space because the trigger effect is really going to help you in the long run. Do you want to play the Whispers cards? Well, the Whispers cards are great at some points. Some points are like, well, I don't really think that's going to help me out. I think playing this card is going to help me more. And there's even some scenarios where I've been like, you know what? I think I'm going to discard the Whispers card. Also, don't even get me started on the the hidden information that makes this game for me. I love the fact everything is hidden. Your uh, your amount of victory points 
hidden, the treason cards, the zeros on the treason cards are beautiful because there are tons in here. And there might be somebody over there who has ten treason cards and the other guy only has five treason cards. And you would think, oh, it's a no-brainer that that guy with five is definitely has less treason than the guy with ten. But that's not necessarily the case. In fact, a lot of the times that may not be the case. There's are so many zeros and you can never truly be sure whose head is on the chopping block. And it provides this great sense of tension. And I like that an awful lot. What else I like about the game? Uh, the, the artwork is perfectly serviceable. I liked it. It fit with the theme of the game component-wise. This is a prototype, and the components were very nice. I enjoyed that. Also, asymmetrical abilities. Love the asymmetrical abilities, especially when you get to the higher player count. So I did mention it stretches out a little bit too long, but that's when the game really shines, is when everybody has their own asymmetrical powers. And that's another thing I forgot to mention the cons. If you don't like asymmetrical powers, this one might not be for you because your special ability that you have and that you're spawning with and starting with could potentially change how you play the game from time to time, which some people aren't going to like. However, I really enjoy. I'd love to see, you know, in the future if this has, you know, stretch goals or expansions or what like that, which I'm getting way ahead of myself. More asymmetrical powers, you know, more cards, more of this, more of that, which is always a good thing when I'm looking forward to exploring the game more before the game's even released. That's how I know I got a winner on my hands when it comes to Kickstarter. Um, other than that, rule booklet is fantastic. It'll have you up and running in no time at all. Answers every question you need. You know, it is a professionally done rule booklet, and that's what I got for you. Council of Blackthorn from Great Northern Games. Doesn't play the best at two players. I worry a little bit about the balance, especially with some of the different asymmetrical powers. Six, five players can stretch out a little bit, but still, a fantastic game, one I highly recommend checking out. That is Council of Blackthorn from Great Northern Games. If you enjoyed this review, please be sure to click on the subscribe button down below in the comments below. Let me know if you were the king, what job would you give your ex-wife slash girlfriend slash boyfriend slash husband uh, slash uh, other thing that's similar. Were you a nice ex-boyfriend? Would you give them a nice cushy job and say, I just want them to be happier? Would you be a vindictive evil one who's like, she's the food poison checker lady? Who knows? What would you do? Me personally, I think it really depends on the ex, to be honest with you. Summer hits, summer miss, either way, I think overall I'd be a pretty nice guy because you never know when you might want to go back to that ex-girlfriend. But, uh, but uh, what am I talking about? Let me know in the comments below what you think. As always, thanks for your time, YouTube.